if you look at the four pictures right in front of you, both in the screens and at my back, it's Tajuddin in four different positions. The first one, he was in the office of the Global Pan-African Movement, where he was signing a document to confirm who should be the so-called Politburo of the Global Pan-African Movement. And the second one, when he was laughing, we had been thrown out of an airline, Kenya Airways, going to Hong Kong. And the third one, where he seated with the laptop, that's the day the Deputy Executive Secretary is talking of when they had dinner in Senegal. Incidentally, he was typing his postcard in a meeting for Global Call to Action Against Poverty in Senegal. And the fourth one, he had just written a postcard called Kenya and I. And you would find him in all these different moods. So it is very befitting that today we sit down here and say to Taju and all other comrades, this is why we used to steal your camera and now we're putting it to good use. But through the cameras, we managed to capture his excellent work. He had a road scholarship. He went to St. Peter's Oxford uh, College in Oxford where he did his DPhil. So there's a whole story where you capture Taju among many different faces. His commitment to African cultural or traditional dress. He was unparalleled in that respect. If you went to his wardrobe, he had many, many dyes and prints and different types of cotton, you know, and all African aesthetics when you look at it. And something very interesting about him, he was always around happy people in the pictures, huh? always around happy people. If you were not happy, he made you happier. Taju went to England in the 80s, and he really cut himself a space where when he went to UK, he was all over the place and managed to sort of mingle with the right people who were around at that particular time. Yeah, 1992, he was appointed to be the Secretary General of the Global Pan-African Movement and left England to stay in Uganda. At that particular time, he was doing the opposite. Many of us Africans were moving from the continent out to the West. Taju did the opposite. Without a salary, he moved to Uganda and was going to live on an allowance. He didn't even know where his income was coming from. So you could see some of the people that he would hang around with, the president of Uganda. We used to call him Dimze, the old man. Huh? On record, I have never heard Tajuddin boast that he could fire a gun. I understand he served national service in Uganda, hung around so many people of different uniforms, but never promoted militarism. And I think it's very important today when I do the rendition to reiterate that he was among highly trained, highly skilled military people. But I can't remember Taju pointing a gun at anybody. Tajuddin's life was a very short one. Uh, Tajuddin was like Padmore, George Padmore, a man of ideas, a man of action, a man of thought. And like Padmore, he died in the struggle for Africa's unity. Tajuddin also believed in the second liberation, a term which Babu coined, Abraham Mohammed Babu coined. For Tajuddin, Pan-Africanism was not just a concept in the classrooms or in conference rooms or in seminars. He saw it as the panacea to the challenges facing Africa. Uh, the African project is a very complicated one, and that is the reason why Tajuddin put it in a different way. One struggle, many fronts. One struggle, many fronts meant that at the youth level, at the level of women, at the level of ex-soldiers, uh, uh, at the level of the trade union movement, at the level of university lecturers association, at the level of, um, of uh, ordinary teachers, that 
the African struggle could be advanced at different, different levels. And at the end, it was just one thing that was uniting us. That is the unity of the African continent and the ability to take the African continent forward in a way that we will control our own resources. So when Silver, Harry Sylvester Williams organized the first Pan-Africa Congress, uh, who we term the grandfather of Pan-Africanism, born in Trinidad in the Caribbean, he studied law in London, and he convened the first Pan-African Conference in 1900. In 1900, with the session of Ethiopia, the rest of Africa was virtually colonized, uh, our resources were all being taken straight to Europe. And the idea was how to get Africans to have what we call African personality, the dignity that Horace Campbell just spoke about. Dubois organized three conferences in the 1920s and the 1930s. At every stage that we organize a Pan-African Congress, there's usually something that brings us together. The three congresses were mainly about culture, driving from the Helen Renaissance, in which a generation of black writers and artists looked to Africa for inspirations and, of course, identity. And some of them include the great uh, Paul Robeson. Taji was trying to say to Africans, don't expect anyone to come and rescue you from your misery. And, and you need to employ new modes of thinking. You know, you need to shed that mental slavery um, if you're going to um, move forward and to be, you know, a, a, and, and to assert your uh, dignity as a human being. Taji was not afraid to use the term imperialism where it's due. Many a time, scholars, or in policy forums like this, we tend to shy away from that term. Right? Imperialism, going back to the definition of Rosa Luxemburg, relates very much to the global expansion of capital. And that came with um, militarization um, and um, domination through uh, intellectual culture as well. Uh, as well. I think we're at an, uh, an important juncture in the history of African people's quest for full self-determination and emancipation. And as Professor Campbell said earlier, a recognition of our humanity at the global scale. Certainly in the academy now, we're, there's a lot of interest in um, the racialized nature of global geopolitics. I mean, it's always been there. Um, Africans have always, and Pan-Africanists have always proclaimed that. But I'm, this a current global geoeconomics and geopolitics is not just racialized, it's also gendered. Right? But if you look at the global economy you know, um, internationally, what you'll find is um, a shift towards more temporal, what they call flexible labor pattern, working patterns or employment patterns. It's affecting people in the north and it's affecting people elsewhere. It means that you can be sacked at any moment. You have, there's no such thing as a job for life. And also, um, wages are, um, you know, there, there is a sort of rush to the bottom in terms of wages. But I think, and democracy has always been presented in Africa as something that comes from outside. Yeah, it's something that has to be borrowed. Um, it is um, certainly it's a process. Um, and often it has to be forced on recalcitrant leaders, especially in the form, as we know, in the 1980s and 1990s of political conditionality. The economic situation was in Africa, as we know, in the 1990s, were, were dire. There were strong movements for democracy on the ground, and incumbent leaders were crippled by debt and structural adjustment. Globalization was kicking off, and Africa, without a strong industrial base, was, um, it was expected to lose out from globalization. It did not seem to matter then, I think, in the rush to make profits from more liberalized market, Africa was seen as inconsequential. And I think that would underlie very much um, the push that took place for democracy in the 1990s, especially the external push. And so there's, there was a lot of push for the promotion of civil society groups. And what we've seen um, as a consequence of that is the emergence of NGOism. 
And I think that's something we need to be critical of. To what extent does N do NGOs or NGOism represent dem democracy in Africa? Right? Or is it just good governance? You know, good governance isn't necessarily about democracy, and I think that's some, you know, we must keep that in mind. It's